Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we're so glad to have you on the first evening of Digital and Archival Approaches to Theater History, a conference in honor of the Philadelphia Playbills project that we've been having at Penn all year and which I'll tell you more about tomorrow in my presentation. Um, and this uh, conference as a whole, as the title suggests, um, addresses digital approaches to studying performance history. It addresses the archives and all those material objects we have related to past theatrical performances. Um, and it's addressing how we deal with both these material and these digital items. And when I thought about who could give a keynote for this kind of conference, um, our, our keynote speaker, Sarah Werner, immediately sprang to mind as somebody who actually knows a great deal about theater history, a great deal about archives, and a great deal about digital humanities. Um, so S Sarah Werner is an independent scholar of book history, performance, and digital tools, hitting all three of those things, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, she sometimes prefers to call herself an independent librarian. The librarians in the room will appreciate. Her career began with a focus on Shakespeare in performance, and she is the author of Shakespeare and Feminist Performance Ideology on the Stage, uh, which came out from Rutledge in 2001. She's the editor of New Directions in Renaissance Drama and Performance Studies, Paul Grave, 2010. And she has since become invested in book history and digital scholarship, especially in the tools and methods we use to invite students and the public into special collections to learn about rare materials. She worked at the Folger Shakespeare Library for nearly a decade as the director of the undergraduate program and digital media strategist. And her latest book, Studying Early Printed Books, 1450 to 1800, A Practical Guide, is out this winter, I hear this coming next month, out in February. Um, it's out from Wiley and is accompanied by a website, www.earlyprintedbooks.com, designed to introduce students to the printed features of hand press books and to provide pedagogical resources for teachers. Her current project is a cultural and technological study of facsimiles, and her talk tonight will address digital ephemera of theater history. So I'll welcome Dr. Sarah Werner. Hi. Um, I want to thank Laura for um, inviting me to do this and giving me the opportunity to return to my old stomping grounds. I think actually Laura didn't mention that the <laughs> place that I did my work and my training in thinking about performance was here. I got my PhD um, from Penn in the English department. Um, lo, these many <laughs> years ago, when, when John and I were classmates, it was that it was it was back in those days, um, and so I've moved away in those days from from thinking about performance, and so this was a nice opportunity for me to try to sort of see the work that I do as nice, um, big round um, continuum in a way that I usually think of myself as having lots of lots of disparate parts. Um, the talk starts off. Um, a little bit more sort of formal and organized. And then as I go through it, it becomes more informal and more depressing. So I'm just going to warn you about that now. I'll try to sound chipper when I talk about the depressing things, and then we'll see if that, if that balances out. Um, there will be a reception after. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you can always hit the bars later. Um, so I want to use the opportunity tonight to think about whether theater history is something that can be digitized or archived. What does it mean to think of theater as a series of connected data points? Names and dates on playbills, financial transactions from playhouse records, employee contracts. What gets omitted or accidentally included in such an approach? And when Laura asked me to, um, as the manner of these things, to provide a t uh, title for her for this talk, and I was thinking, there are so many possibilities, and I came up with digital ephemera of theater history, thinking, well, this pretty much covers all possible bases. Um, I really think that I'm going to structure the talk around these different, break it down into different little pieces for us. So we'll start off by thinking about ephemera of theater. Usually when talking about theatrical ephemera, we're discussing the various printed items that were intended only to be used briefly and then tossed. 
things like playbills, window cards, programs, tickets, the material used to get us into the show and into our seats. We're lucky that obsessive theater fans and accidental hoarders saved such material for us, since by its nature, it wasn't intended to be passed down into archives and libraries for us to study. This playbill for a January 1848 performance of Jane Eyre, or The Secrets of Thornfield Manor, is a lovely example of the sort of printed ephemera whose accidental survival we are dependent on for our theatrical history. It's for a new production of Jane Eyre that came out just a few months after the novel was published, when its author was still Kerr Bell, and just, you can see just above Jane, I, don't, I didn't blow up these little details, you can say, by Kerr Bell. Um, the playbill gives us the names of the major figures associated with the production. At the bottom part underneath air, you can see lots of names of the actors and the roles that they're playing. Uh, it gives us their roles, it gives us the cost of the entrance, the dates of performance. It also um, fantastically describes the pantomime, the pantomime that concludes the evening, the World of Wonders, or the Harlequin Caxton, and the actors and the roles for that delightful sounding panto. Um, you'll have to go back and read it at some time. It's, from, um, it's online at NYPL. So this playbill, which is now held at the New York Public Library in the Billy Rose Theater Collection, is one of two surviving copies, although the other, now at Bristol, is a different state that omits the name of the playwright. The play, without an attribution of authorship, itself survives only in the Lord Chamberlain's collection of plays now at the British Library, that is, those manuscript copies of plays that were submitted for licensing. There are also references to the play in Charlotte Bronte's correspondence. Um, the play was being put on stage just as she was getting ready for the second edition, and there was some anxiety about how this might um, impact her reputation. Um, she did not sound super impressed with the play, unsurprisingly. Um, and there also were ads for it in a couple of issues of the era. So it's not that we wouldn't know about this play without this playbill, but knowing who wrote it would certainly be a lot trickier to ascertain, and we'd be missing a great deal of context for its production. This type of material is ideal for OCR and linked data in lots of ways. I mean, just look at it. Much of it is made up of data points that beg to be connected to other ones. What other roles did these actors play? What other performances at other theaters were happening on this date? When did entrance prices shift? But how should we approach this playbill for a 1925 Akron, Ohio performance of Dear Enemy? There is, in the middle box, some production information but it's surrounded by ads to re-elect a councilman, for a title company, a deli, and a taxi and trucking company. And that's just the first page. This is a 10-page bill, which I love, with bits of information about the production on each page and lots and lots of ads throughout. There are way more ads than there are information about the production. There's an ad for a moose circus one for a dentist that appears just above one for a lunch place called Candyland. <laughs> Psychic science. This is really not so different from modern playbills, of course. But how do we treat this in a digital theater history project? Do you focus only on the information that's directly connected to the performance? transcribing and linking the theatrical staff, for instance, but not any of the ads? Maybe you note the presence and buyer of the ad, but not its content? Do you keep in your transcription the physical indicators of the ads, which are on which pages, with which bit of theatrical info, which words are prominent, which have images? It's a pretty slack theater historian who would tell you that all those ads aren't relevant. They certainly are. But do you also note the leaf that's pink paper? Who is your project's audience? Theater historians or print historians? Some of us might be sometimes both. Let's take a moment to appreciate the material aspects of theatrical ephemera, 
which are usually printed as basic job work and initially as broadsides, that is, on a single side of a sheet of paper and often as a quarter sheet, small little things and fragile. As ephemeral go, however, playbills seem to survive in higher rates than, say, certificates or trade cards or lottery tickets. But they're still flimsy things and initially pretty bland looking. But as the iron press took over from the wooden common press in the early 19th century, the topography of playbills became more varied. Different typefaces and font sizes, different colored inks, more text, in part through changing conventions, but also because of the different capabilities of the new press. And as printing technologies continued to change, so did the form of the playbill. The effects of these technologies also shaped how these ephemera became part of the theatrical experience. The detailed playbills David Webster Osbaldston used at the Vic were, as we saw with the Jane Eyre one, heavily printed on flimsy paper and were famous for their detail and sentimental exhortations. As George Sims recalled in his memoirs, however gingerly you handled those bills, some of the black came off on you. And so it happened that when you wiped away a sympathetic tear with your finger, you frequently left a black streak down your cheek. Uh -huh. I once saw the audience turn out of the old fic after the performance of an old-fashioned drama of the weepy weepy order, and the faces of the crowd were a study in black and white. Sometimes it seems amazing that these things survive at all. This one, for instance, seems to have survived in large part because it was sent home as a letter, and then presumably filed away with the bills and receipts it, it contained instructions for. And much theatrical ephemera wouldn't have survived if it weren't for obsessive theater fans hanging onto them. I should be clear that I was once one of them, and I would still be if my life was slightly different. The years I lived in London in the mid-90s, seeing everything I could possibly see in writing my dissertation, were for a long time documented in all the programs and ticket stubs I saved from everything that I'd seen. I hung onto all that ephemera when I moved back to the States and when I moved from Philadelphia up to Montreal, and then I moved back to Philadelphia, and then I moved to Alexandria, and then I moved to Silver Spring, until around 2010, when I moved houses again and had to put a lot of stuff into storage. By that point, I was immersed in the sort of book history that I do now, and in a frenzy of cleaning and packing, moving house with two little kids will create frenzies like that, I tossed it all out. I know. I don't know what I was thinking. It pains me now to think of it. I was not expecting, actually, you guys all to make that noise, but that's the noise I make to myself when I think about it now. It's not rational, right? I have no use for that material. It would have just sat in my trunk for another few decades, maybe until it became my kid's responsibility to clear it out. And that's another reason for cleaning frenzies, having to clean out your parents' house. Don't pass on your hoarding to your kids, please. But why do I miss it? Why did I keep it in the first place? Why do I still feel that spark of joy when I find an old ticket stub in one of my books? It's a funny phrase, ephemera of theater, isn't it? Because isn't theatrical performance itself ephemeral? What is left of a performance other than the bits of paper and cloth and wood that constituted it and the memories of the performers and audience? The gestures and sounds of a production do not remain. The smells and tastes of the air do not keep. The collective inhalation of audience breath and this sudden, attentive stillness do not last. Like other live performances, theater exists in the moment you experience it, and any later versions translate it into a different medium. Photographs, video, narratives. 
In the early 1990s, which is to say when I was working on my studies, this sense of performance as ephemeral dominated the field through Peggy Phelan's astonishing book, Unmarked, in which she examined the politics of performance and argued for the importance of seeing live events as only ever existing in the present. If live performance only ever exists in the moment and then disappears forever after, Phelan argued, that was a feature, not a bug, to use a current metaphor. The value of performance is in its disappearance, in other words. The ephemerality of theater is what makes it theater. I just want to say, I didn't stage this. I literally pulled down my copy of a mark to verify something, and I was like, oh my God, it's that. It had a ticket in it, and the ticket is for the Anna DeVere Smith show of Twilight, which seemed really fitting, and then I really did do it on an Instagram story, and then it's all about ephemerality. But theater also anticipates and reflects itself. Gestures and sounds may accumulate meanings over the course of a single performance, while blocking and costuming might harken back to earlier productions and performers. There are actor traditions that get handed down through generations. Yorick's skull, by which I mean a literal skull, is one handed down from actor to actor, sometimes the skull of a known person turned into a prop living again on stage. The umbrellas that Michael Bogdanoff used in his 1970s production of The Taming of the Shrew showed up in Gail Edwards' 1990s one. The lullaby that Simon Russell Beale sang as Leontes in the opening of A Winter's Tale became a haunting refrain that builds on its association with love and loss over the course of that production. A gun that's introduced in Act One looks forward to the future when it will go off in Act Three. Performance, thank you, Dan. I don't know why the rest of you didn't laugh at that joke. I thought that was good. Performance, in other words, doesn't move through time linearly, nor does it disappear in a flash. If theater's printed ephemera is intended to be ephemeral, and let's be clear, those 10 quid West End programs and their predecessors aren't intended to be ephemeral, theater itself is more complicated. And even as that printed ephemera might represent a performance in terms of data points, what it omits is also part of a production's simultaneous longevity and evanescence. So maybe ephemeral isn't the right framework here. Performance disappears in the moment, but it also recalls and persists, looking both back and forward, even if we can't always see what's there. The challenge, then, isn't how to recover past productions, but how to enable a space for studying performance that allows both structured data and ephemeral echoing experience to contribute to its shape. The sense of performance looking to the past and to the future while disappearing from the present is akin to how we might think about the relationship between digital and ephemeral. One of the funny things about creating digital products, as many of you here know, is that they are both insistently ephemeral and possessed of stubbornly persistent ephemera. It shouldn't be a stretch to think of digital as ephemeral. Didn't back up your database before upgrading, only to discover an incompatibility with the latest update? Oops! Your whole site might come crashing down before with months of work needing to be recreated. Have you read a news story and then come back to the article a few hours later to discover the key bit you are interested in has been changed? Remember that time you wrote about that great thing you found online and then when it was time for copy edits, you discovered that link didn't work anymore? Or the digital products you were discussing were no longer relevant because more than a year had passed? My 2018 article on performance and digital editions of Shakespeare, by the way, is a really good snapshot of how to think about the state of things in 2015, in case you're looking for something along those lines, but doesn't really serve any purpose other than that. 
Although my 2017 piece on digital facsimiles of the first folio is holding up really well, I'll say. Um, so I guess it depends on what you're writing about and perhaps is an indication of how very slowly the world of digital imaging is changing. All of these shiny surfaces and rapidly changing content contribute to a sense of digital ephemerality, even if we know that's also not exactly true. All that disappearing media is built on and into solid metals that retain traces of their inscription. It's not nearly as fragile as we think it is. And if you haven't read Matt Kirschenbaum's mechanisms and what he argues is a key tension between digital media's formal materiality and its forensic materiality, you should go do that. But I want to remind us that the digital realm is persistent not only materially, but also in terms of its data. Decisions we make for a project that makes sense at the time or that we didn't even pause over for careful consideration can have a lasting impact on later instances of that project. The biz biggest example of this seems ridiculous, but was also potentially catastrophic. Y2K. We all know this one, yeah? Because data storage was so very expensive in its early days, there was tremendous pressure on programmers to use as little as possible. And so the convention of indicating years with a two-digit two number instead of a four-digit one was carried on up into programming. And it made perfect sense at the time. Why write out 1954 when it was obviously the 20th century? But when the end of the century crept near, as time outside of the theater tends to move relentlessly forward, we were faced with a world which on New Year's Day, we'd wake up to all, programmings, all programs expressing the date as 1900, not 2000. And of course, by that time, programs were everywhere, not just computers, but elevators and cars and bank machines and you name it. The potential for disaster wasn't just that your desktop would freeze up, but that the systems that controlled finances and air safety and the power grid and communications that it would all malfunction. And so we all hoarded water and batteries and cash in the month leading up to it just in case. Thanks, of course, to a frenzied push in the last years of the century, the first day of the year 2000 came and went calmly enough. Other examples of this type of unplanned ephemera shaping decisions down the line abound. Body trust that great digital library is highly and deliberately optimized for ingesting mass digitized materials. All their systems, workflows, data models, etc., presume receipt of files from Google or the Internet Archive in specific image file formats with specifically structured digital object specifications. It works really smoothly. But what happens when it wants to ingest all those government PDFs that are now flooding the web? It grinds to a halt. The Consortium of Electronic Literature is trying to create a single database of all ELIT projects, which would be awesome because right now they're scattered everywhere and if you study it, you can't really find them. But guess what? Member organizations each structured their own database independently and differently and so there's not an easy way to pull that information together into a single search. Then there's Dublin Core's great vision to create an easy, uniform metadata for everything, including digital objects. Although in 1995, what sort of digital objects did we have? We had web pages, which meant that a decade later, it couldn't handle much of the digital objects that needed to be cataloged. And even the qualified terms a decade later failed to fully address the needs of the moving target of digital metadata. I assume most of you know about the work underway on the London Stage Database, which seeks to update the 1970s London Information Bank, but in so doing must not only recover but reshape its data to work within current frameworks. I'm guessing maybe we'll hear something about that tomorrow. I don't know. Um, if not, maybe we can sort of chat informally with people who know more about that, but that's a really prime example that fits in with our interests of this problem. My point is that even as we think about digital projects as being products, as being ephemeral, the terms under which we construct them continue on long past their beginnings. 
shaping how they operate and what we can and cannot do with them. Any digital product you use, tool, database, website, will always be simultaneously of the moment you're using it and of the moment it was made. In this, perhaps, it's no different than reading an old book or wearing an old piece of clothing. But we do not think of books and clothing as readily disappearing. Or at least, we didn't before we hit the world of Target and disposable clothes that you wear for a season and then turn to trash, sending them off to landfills or to the other side of the globe to be someone else's problem. Now, perhaps it is more accurate to say that we think of everything as being disposable, not only clothes and books and ephemera, but projects and careers and everything in service of the grants we seek to replace the steadier funds and endowments that used to support the edifice of education and the arts. I'll be honest, I didn't mean for this talk to veer in this direction. But I find it increasingly impossible to talk about digital work without talking about the impact it is having not only on the contingent staff we use to perform so much of this work, but on the life of our planet and its population. Last summer, I was part of a panel with a bunch of archivists and conservators arguing about the proposition of whether digitization equaled preservation. Folks came down on both sides of the equation for valuable and convincing reasons, but all I could think about was having just returned from the wretched heat wave in England and how unprepared even countries that accepted the acceleration of climate change were to handle it. It's not disconnected to what we do. All of our work, not simply the image taking and data processing, but more significantly, the data storage and redundancies and serving up higher and higher resolution files, all that work takes energy, energy that is overwhelmingly drawn from coal and other fossil fuels, and that therefore directly adds to rising global temperatures. Digitization isn't preservation, I told the room at SAA, because when we digitize objects, we are adding to the rising sea levels that are going to ruin somebody's archives. Maybe not ours, but somebody's. What sort of history are we preserving when we are destroying vulnerable histories to make it happen? The question we're wrestling with at this event is not quite the same, but it's not far off either. What's our responsibility to history? I mentioned funding before and the ever-present past of the digital lurking behind what we can do. There is a tremendous bias in our world, in education, in libraries, in archives, in funding agencies, toward the new and shiny. A bias in favor of discovery instead of stability, a preference for innovation over maintenance. While that bias might make sense on our part, we need grant money and donations to replace what used to be money from the government and other sources. It also means that we are contributing to a constant churn of digital production, developing new products as a way of funding basic needs like cataloging and hiring staff on a term-limited basis instead of regularly renewing and cultivating the talent we already have. What sort of history are we creating for the future? It's not an easy question to answer, but I think it's one that theater and libraries and archives are in a position to ask. That was my chipper ending. <laughs> Testing. So um, Sarah's left us with some big questions, but are there questions for her? I'll come around with the mic if there are. And everyone can digest for a few minutes. That's always necessary.
I, um, you kind of circled back to this point, but you started off saying that this material is meant to be ephemeral, meant to be thrown away, et cetera. But as you also point out, a lot of it was kept by people like more in a higher ratio than other similar kinds of ephemera were kept because the performances yeah. had some kind of meaning for the people. So I mean, it's a little bit contradictory there, but my sense is that the reason we have so many playbills vis-a-vis other types of ephemera is, is inherent to it. The performance right that the right that so i guess my sense is that like it does actually the reason we have a sort of surfeit of theatrical ephemera is because it was in fact kept and so which kind of belies this notion that it was like meant to be thrown away well I, I, that's a good point and i think my response is that there is a difference between how something is how it's makers think of it and how its users think of it. Um, and I do not know, but maybe somebody in this audience could tell us when the concept of souvenir programs began to be a thing, because um, souvenir programs are a thing and have been a thing for at least a century, a century and a half, I don't know. Um, but early playbills were not... There wasn't a souvenir equivalent. I really think that they were intended to be. You gave them to the audience, then whatever. But people don't, we don't respond to performances the way that um, actors and directors always expect us to respond to performances. We don't use books the way that they expect us to use books. And so to some degree, that that response of wanting to keep something um, is is not necessarily connected to how its makers intended it to be used. Um, and the other the other. Part of that, and again, I don't know enough about Playbill specifically, and I'd be sort of curious to to go and find out. What I really wanted to know is whether I really want somebody to have written a uh, a book that's sort of like a book history of theater culture, so that I could find out more information about like Playbills and about tickets, and like when were the first printed tickets, and where are they, and I need to find out more information about this. So if somebody wants to do that, that'd be that'd be awesome. Um, but in other aspects of printed ephemera, so not stuff that comes from the theater world, but from our large world of printed ephemera, um, the stuff that gets saved gets saved because it gets saved accidentally, right? It gets it gets caught up in a book binding. It gets um, it falls behind a wall. It gets left up in the <laughs> it gets left up in the attic for forever, and then suddenly, next thing you know, you've got Titus Andronicus. Um, that makes it sound like it's sort of like a like yeast rising, and then it turns into Titus Andronicus. Um, so I'm, I, that is how ephemera happens. I think the slightly higher proportion of it has something to do with that emotional tie with it, but I don't think that's connected necessarily to how the intender, how the makers intended it to be used. I could be wrong. I I just wanted to offer my two cents on that because I think that. The makers of it knew that some of it was going to be saved and some of it was going to be thrown out. I mean, I I come from I have a theatrical background, musical backgrounds, so I know how I produce materials. You know how I produce publicity materials and how others have produced them. And um, you know, from the beginning of opera, there were libretti, and those survive. Mm -hmm. You know, and they you know. Theoretically speaking, they were going to disappear after a performance, but no, people held on to them. And I think that the people producing these things expected some of it to survive. And uh, I think that's the same with playbills. You know, I know that my stuff that I've produced, I was surprised, at, you know, at first I was surprised that people would hold on to stuff. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Because <laughs> I do the same thing when I go to something. I will hold on to playbills and stuff, for, you know, for... No readily apparent reason. <laughs> right, <laughs> like yeah, you exactly. And then you find it a decade later. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's possible. It, it, my, my own methodological bias is I am always wary of assuming that people in the past had the same motivations that I did. Um, and so my impulse is to sort of like save things. I don't, I just tend not to want to assume that that was, it doesn't mean that that wasn't true in the past. That's just my own, I, that's, I'm always reluctant to assume that. I think it just has to do with how I was, the English department in which I was trained. Um, two possibilities. Uh, one, I think people save things uh, for uh, based on the occasion 
on which they got them. For instance, in the 19th century, special moments in the theater, uh, someone's uh, retirement, for instance, produce special programs. Mm -hmm. You know what you're referring to. Um, and people tended to save those. The other thing I think is a possibility is that people save things when they have been deprived of them. Um, people, I began saving theater programs when I realized that I couldn't go to the theater all the time. Once I began to go to the theater all the time, I probably saved them less. You know? That's interesting. And, and especially, I could imagine that it could be possible for somebody to do a study to see if programs from benefit productions are, are exist in a higher rate than the non-benefit productions, and that might indicate something along the lines of what of what you're talking about. I don't I don't know enough about their history. Just a comment. Just a comment. That it's a great point that the gentleman just made. Um, I still have my John Leguizamo's um, performance playbills from New York many years ago, and you know, and recently I was in London and I didn't get a playbill for um, uh, Patty Lapone's company because they charged for it. So now that you're being, yeah, so now playboys are not necessarily always free. And that took away a little bit of the oomph because now I don't have anything except the ticket to remember that performance. But the gentleman who said, yeah, you save things because you're not quite sure when the next time will be when you can get to go see this, these amazing performances. That could be. There was an odd, this past summer I was in uh, Stratford and saw a bunch of RSC productions and I did not I didn't buy any programs like this was like a really super weird thing for me I did not buy I did not buy a program um, and partly because of the, the the prices had gone up so much um, and in my head it was still sort of like two quid or something for a program but that was in 1994 and of course it's not it's still not it's not that cheap um, and it was really disorienting. It was disorienting at the time because I didn't know what the actors' bios were. And then I wanted to tell, I, I cut it. I wanted to tell an anecdote about seeing their, um, they did a Duchess of Malfi that covered the stage with so much blood and it smelled so strong and I could barely breathe. I had a whole thing where I wanted to talk about sort of smell and how do we capture smell and then I, I got rid of it. Um, but I wanted to be able to sort of look at the, program to, I, I don't know what, what, what remember what I wanted to look up about it, and I didn't have the program, so I ended up not talking about it, but the smell is a different question. We can come back to it at some point, but it was, it was intense, that smell. It made a lot of us cough. It was actually really dusty and unpleasant. So I'm interested in uh, scrapbooking. I know at the at New York Public Library, we have a, a lot of our programs are actually in scrapbooks, and some of them seem to have been commercially manufactured for the express purpose of storing playbills, uh, even in the 19th century. I mean, the playbill binders from the 1950s were the same kind of thing, but even in the 19th century, there's the put your ticket here, paste your program there. So it does seem like there's a, a commercialization of this desire to save this ephemera that's at least 100 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm especially interested in what, how you ended your, your talk with the, the questioning of digitization as preservation or I I as part of the preservation uh, work. And I mean, it's one that obviously is, I think, very real for a lot of us um, that work in libraries. And I, I wonder if it's as neat as saying that digitization adds to all the environmental problems and purely storing something doesn't. Because I, I think that in the the world of cloud servers, like we've, we've got a certain of economy of scale that makes it so that the addition of a couple of, or even a couple million books to an Amazon server probably doesn't dramatically increase the heat that that requires, but the one freezer that I've got in the basement storing nitrates probably is melting a lot more ice caps. So I'm just, like, I, I think it's, it's interesting to like look at that, that cost value analysis a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And part of, so it depends a lot on what media we're talking about. Um, and so I, I was on this panel partly as a, an old books person, and so I was talking about digitizing images of, um, you know, stuff that we just left it alone and be fine. Books from the hand press period, they're not, you know, like I'm not even talking about 19th century. Lord, Lord knows, like, 20th century books are a disaster, right? Um, and I wasn't talking about film, and I wasn't talking about photographs, other things in which the need to remediate them is going to be what's going to preserve them. 
Um, and you're absolutely right that the amount of um, carbon that we are contributing and the energy that we are contributing by adding our little pile to the cloud is tiny compared to what um, Wall Street is doing with all of the sort of data analysis constantly churning away. Um, but part of the questions, but partly we don't ask those questions in part because, and then I didn't spend hardly any time on this, so thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to say more. Um, we're so caught up, I think, oftentimes in doing these new projects um, and creating new images and creating new finding aids and doing transcriptions that we aren't always pausing to think about the user experience of them and the finding of them. So um, again, I spend most of my time thinking about digitization of books and books images, and they, it's extraordinarily hard to find images of something. Like whether you wanted to browse or whether you're looking for something specific. Um, you just, you can't. And so there's all these libraries creating all of these images. Why? Like nobody's gonna find them or they find it. And it's just a picture of a book and it doesn't tell you anything about it. Um, and the places that do create some sort of context for it are few and far between. And there's really good reasons for that because the platforms that we use don't provide space to be able to do that, right? Um, and most places don't have the sort of handcrafted um, skin that NYPL was able to do. Um, and so it's not it's less a question I, for me when I actually be more nuanced than what I say of don't do this anymore. It's just think about why you're doing it before you do it. And think about it before you do it instead of after you've already done it and you're like, well, I already struck, I did it like this and now I'm stuck, right? Like just, just ask, just ask sometimes. I mean, I think it's really, I think structurally it's really hard because I do think that this pressure to get new grants is really strong um, for lots of us in the in organizations of the cultural heritage industry. Um, and it's, I actually love the, the, the clear hidden collections program is, is really pretty good. But generally speaking, like there's not, there's not grants for cataloging, right? Like, Aside from aside from the clear hidden collections, are there are there grants for cataloging stuff? Does people know? Not so much anymore, right? But what you can do is you can create this fancy project about digitizing and transcribing whatever, and that will let you catalog. And it's a great way of getting cataloging money, which absolutely needs to be done because otherwise, how do you get access to this material? But it also means that. This other stuff is happening kind of as a byproduct of what your really sort of hidden thing is. And if you used to have regular for state institutions, you know, the, the state governments used to give universities a lot more money than they do now. So now you've got to get money from somewhere else. And for those of us who were always contingently employed, it's in one sense good for us because there's lots of grants. We need to hire people for three years. The other hand, is really bad for us because you could only ever get hired for three years because there's not as many full-time jobs anymore. Um, so there's this sort of like circle, and I don't know that any of our institutions are in a place to fix this problem. It's it's much bigger, but I think it's all part of the same issues. Mm -hmm. I went way far afield from what you asked us, but um, thank you. Um, this is really thought-provoking, Sarah. Um, just thinking about sort of your um, this. Two, two aspects that you brought up, uh, sort of the question of, of grants and the question of the ephemerality of digital projects, right? Because in some ways there's a contradiction there, right? Because whenever you write a grant for a digital project, there's a section on sustainability. Yeah. How are you going to make sure that this stuff that we're giving you money for will forever live in a digital world no matter mm -hmm. what else, right? So there, there's a way in which we, we acknowledge that digital thing, there is ephemerality in the digital world, and one in which we also deny it every time we ask for money. Yes. <laughs> I don't quite know where that's going, but I thought. <laughs> I don't either, but I think you're absolutely right. When I was, I, when I was just at MLA, I was talking with a bunch of, of librarians at a session, and we sort of ended up stumbling onto that part too. And again, this sort of tension, which it is both at the same time, and it's contradictory, but it's also the same thing. And, it, and 
but what's clearly the sense is you can't just say, you can't, it would be the kiss of death to apply for a grant or for anything and say like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this thing for three years and then, and then I'm just gonna let it wither. And on the other hand, like maybe that's not so bad, maybe that's fine. Like you can't continue something for forever. It costs, so it's so much in time and money and things are constantly changing and you can't just, it's not as easy as just upgrading. I mean, at some point you have to, it, it just, it doesn't work like that. Um, and maybe it doesn't need to exist forever. I don't know, we, like those of us who write monographs, do we write a book and say, and my book is gonna be valuable forever. <laughs> I mean, my book will be valuable forever, please go buy it. <laughs> Bye. I don't, I don't, there was this weird expectation with sort of like sustainability that we talk about with digital stuff. We don't publish journal articles with the expectation that they're gonna be valuable for forever, but somehow this digital project is gonna, I don't know, it'd be nice. Maybe it'd be nice if we thought, so we make promises that nobody really holds us to. Um, there are some, the Office of Digital Humanities at NEH has a program that is, am I remembering this right, that is specifically about sustainability. I think they've got a grants program. So. Um, so there are some places, and they actually talk a lot about the need for sustainability and the need to provide funding for this sort of problem. But of course they're, I mean, they can't do whatever they want to do either. They have people that they have to answer to, so. Uh, if I can go back to the um, question you raised earlier about the difference between the purpose for which playbills and handbills were created and why people saved them, uh, I think there might be a shift that corresponds with a kind of watershed in the 19th century uh, from considering a performance with the word performance during the time of the duopoly uh, a century and a half or two centuries of of only two or at most three legitimate theaters in London to the time after the reform bill where the, where the um, population of London and transportation had increased and improved so that you can properly use the word production. And I always point out to my students that the industrial sense of the word production is relevant here. That you're creating a theater piece that's designed to be the same from night to night. That's designed to have a long run because there's enough of an audience to sustain a long run. Right. Um, and then when it goes out on tour, it's going out on tour, not with a single actor, but with the full company and a set, which if it isn't the, the London or the New York production, is a carbon copy of the New York production, licensed or produced by the same people so that your experience of it matches the experience of the original in New York or in London. And, and in one hand, in the, in the first case, I think what's being documented is the difference between one night and another, where a theater is doing things in repertoire and they're doing multiple, multiple plays, mm -hmm. uh, multiple bills, multiple plays in one evening, a full evening's entertainment and um, a production that's designed to have a reproducible original. And having an elaborate program is part of what you can afford to do if you're amortizing, right. um, the, 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 if, if you're putting money up for a production which you expect to recoup over a long run. And I think people who, who collect those when they see them might be collecting them to be able to say that I saw Hamilton with the original cast. Right. And I'm curious, uh, as, as a pack rat, uh, who have kept, kept every theater program, no stubs, but every theater program, do you keep the little tags that say, at tonight's performance, the understudy is going to be in? Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, before I threw them all out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for that wonderful talk. I wanted to just talk about the idea that people have of with digital projects of completeness and maybe the craziness of the whole idea of completeness. Because I don't know that we need to digitize everything. And I think we need to th rethink some of these things. There are things that, you know, 
maybe we have to rethink the whole project of digital humanities in terms of, you know, archives and things like that. Maybe it's just not appropriate. And, um, you know, maybe we're investing a lot of money in things that really don't need to be done, but may, or develop other types of projects that give you that sense of the whole, but doesn't have to be every single item. I mean, I, I understand people have this idea that we're going to get everything and we're going to digitize it, but it doesn't make sense for, you know, all kinds of reasons. So I just wanted to, you know, mention that. I think the other is that on the other side of it, there's a huge amount of redundancy that's happening in digitizing the same things. And so you've got the two pieces of it. One is the idea of completeness, the other idea that, oh, we're digitizing the same book X did and Y did. And I mean, does it make sense? Maybe it does for certain things. I mean, if you've got annotated copies or something, or, you, you know, but I'm just saying, think, rethinking some of these kinds of issues around digitization. So I, I, a couple of a couple of things, and the, the I, I'm my next project is somehow vaguely about sort of like the history of facsimiles. And part of it has to do with I don't know like how we got to this point. And clearly, with creating digital facsimiles of books, um, it started off as such a sort of expensive and rare thing that everybody was doing their treasures. Right, and so this is how we end up with all these first folios. Um, and it made it made great sense when Penn did theirs, um, and there were hardly any other ones. Penn's was a really early one, but then everybody does there. Now we have, and yeah. there's, there's no difference between the <laughs> 25 that are currently whatever. I can't remember. I think my count is out of date now. They're all they're all the same. Um, and so there, so that sort of duplication, and there's very little coordination between libraries are annoyingly. Um, not forthcoming about sharing information. <laughs> how, how do I phrase that gently? Um, they're very good keep things close to the, close to the chest. Um, and so rethinking in that way makes a lot of sense. The, um, there, I think there has been, and the other, the, the first set of your question about, like, do we need to, well, obviously, no, everything's not going to be imaged. It's, it's ridiculous when people think that. I mean, we all know that, and it's ridiculous when people think they do that. But maybe there is stuff that shouldn't be, and so maybe that's a ridiculous goal. Like, not only is it not reachable, maybe we shouldn't even pretend to be reaching it. So there's a, um, why am I blanking on what her last name is? Kim Christensen? Kim Christensen? The woman who works with Mercurio. Does anybody know her talking about? Is that her name? Yeah. Um, so she has this platform, this digital platform that was developed uh, among a couple of different schools for work with indigenous communities um, that allowed them to retain control over what was going to be made open and what was going to be kept closed. Because some of those materials are just for the community and they are not to be made open, understandably so, um, in a very sort of deliberate and thoughtful way. Um, and so as she has gone out and talked more about this and sort of like raised more awareness about this question of who do materials belong to and what does it mean to share openly and should everything be shared openly? Um, for me, it's been a really useful prompt for thinking about why do we, why do we think open is, I mean, like I'm a huge, I'm a huge open access proponent, right? Like I spent all of this time being like yelling at people for copyright stuff. But that's different to me than saying what's valuable is it its owners get to choose what they want to do with it. My my issues with copyright is that they don't even own it. <laughs> it's just like, you know, um, and there's all sorts of legit stuff. I I remember talking with somebody once and they had I don't know if I was in charge of a collection and there was a lot of racist material in that collection, I would not be imaging that to put online openly. There's just more harm done with that than there is possible good. Um, I would write up lots of descriptions, lots of like come and study and come and work with us and come and learn about it, but the images are a different sort of thing. Because once you put it online, it escapes, and that's the beauty of putting things online. Um, and if we were to take away that goal of imaging everything, think how much that would free us up to maybe we just maybe we could collaborate and maybe different libraries can image what they think is you know, a portion of their strong suit and then maybe we could create context. So 
instead of seeing random pictures, you could be like, that's what this picture is. Oh my God. Wouldn't that be more in tune with sort of like libraries' missions of, of education and preserving for the future instead of just showing a sort of like random decontextualized piece of information to show it and say, here's what we can learn and ask about this. So I love that idea of rethinking that whole goal. Go out and tell people to do that. Our role is endorsed. Thanks. Um, kind of on that note, I was wondering if you could say more about how academic institutions and libraries and archives think about preserving ephemera as opposed to theaters and theatrical companies. And you alluded to props and songs that resurface in iterative performances um, as a mode of uh, continuity or preservation. But that might open up other questions about collaboration. So I know very little about, actually, about how theater companies self-archive. Um, there are others in the audience who would know more about that. Doug could go ahead and talk more about that. But I think it's a really good question. I'd love to hear more on Yeah, so I mean, I can talk to the New York world. Um, a lot of the major off-Broadway companies do have an archivist on site, either full-time or part-time. The Roundabout does, for sure. La Mama does. The public theater used to have actually a huge group, and then they kind of outsourced it to us. Um, there's also a project called the American Theater Archive Project um, that's kind of sort of associated with um, ASTR, the um, American Society for Theater Research, uh, that is trying to train, uh, have archivists train theater companies in just the very basics of archiving. Uh, usually what happens is the, um, the PR person or team is assigned to that because they're the ones that need to pull out the photographs for the 10th anniversary season or whatever, and then they dig it out from under the founder's bed or wherever else it is. But, um, but it does seem like, I mean, I think the theater community, because of, as you point out, the ephemerality of the art form, is fairly thoughtful about these things. They're not always trained, but they are yeah. thinking about it. And they are, I mean, they do tend to end up in somebody, some part of the company has kept it, um, and will make it available if you ask. Yeah, that's, um, I think there's a, there's a, I mean, right, in my super limited experience, um, from when I was studying and thinking about performance stuff, folks who are um, directors and dramaturgs who are really working with sort of creating stuff, real hunger to know sort of what has been done, like looking for things to spark creativity, right? And so in that sense, not only also then creates an impetus to like record. Also, I think that aren't we all just a little bit, um, I mean, thank God for this, aren't all humans just a little bit sort of like proud of the work that we do and like you want to feel like you've made your mark. And so when you're, if your art form is writing books, it's really easy for me to be like, oh, look, it's sitting on the shelf. But if your art form is, it's much harder to sort of be able to point to that. And so what you're gonna end up keeping is clippings and the, you know, the 50 million different versions of the blockings that you went through. Um, and hopefully holding on to that just because it's free. Art is off. It's such a wonderful talk, uh, Sarah. Thank you so much. It's beautiful, and I love to hear you think about all this. So I'll throw one other thing out that maybe can be part of later conversations, too, and it comes back to the first playbill you showed and my limited experience with looking at these things. And I wondered just maybe to think, if you could think a little bit about ephemerality and mass. We Many of us in this room here are... are responsible for collections with massive numbers of playbills um, in a funny way. Um, and I'm also interested in the, this strange visual effect of a lot of playbills, certainly even 18th century ones and spectacularly 19th century ones where there is a massive information on them. Um, and of course, the mass effect of data and data storage. And I, I don't know what to do with that, except I think it's a challenge to me in thinking about uh, the data in a playbill. You know, Laura's project is trying to come up with really interesting ways of 
capturing mass, but you know, just the mass information goes beyond what any cataloger in a library ever wants to do, um, because it's much more than a title and an author and a copyright line, um, and it's both you know fragile and vanishing and evanescent and massive. I don't know that I have an answer. So I'm really, I'm, I myself am very much looking forward to tomorrow and hearing from the people who actually are. So I get asked all these questions. Do you, do you kind of look at this? Do you kind of look at this? And you all have had to actually be like, yes, no, sometimes, right? And so I'm really like, how do you make those decisions? Um, because just, I mean, like, what what count, what counts is is counting. When I look at those playbills, I don't know how you how you make those decisions. Um, and it does seem like it's one of those things. Um, I've been having this conversation a lot recently with other rare books people about this sense of um, I don't know. Aaron Pratt is on a, a kick these days about like how many how many rare books do you need to look at before you just have a sense of like what a book looks like and what's typical and what's not typical. Um, and the same thing with playbills, like how many, I don't look at enough playbills to have a sense. Like every time I look at a new playbill, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Oh, that's about what? <laughs> I was like, okay, well, clearly some of this is not. I mean, like, it's <laughs> for what's happening. Um, but there is, so there's this, ma so they're, they're so important on the individual level, but you've got to look at, I don't know how many do you need to look at in order to get a sense of what the patterns are. And then, of course, they always give you new things. I can tell you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you think there's a pattern, and then there's not. Chronologically, I'll see sort of like changes, and I was like, no, they're just they're just doing their they're just doing their thing. Um, so that, that again, I guess that balance to answer your question is like I don't know, but that balancing of the individual with the huge collective um, seems a really key part of thinking, particularly about. Playbills, which are in themselves so tiny, so huge, at the same time. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. We're going to give you another round of applause. Okay. Oh, here's the mic. Um,